Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to the talk today. Uh, so this is Scott Williams. He is the CEO of uh, Zangtronics. Have I pronounced that correctly? Yes. Yes, and it, they uh, specialize in making uh, PCBs and electrical control systems for domestic and international clients. And yeah, they make efficient, cheap, and very good PCBs in electrical systems. But Scott will tell you a little more about himself. All right, thank you everyone for coming. It's um, nice to see you all. Uh, I just gave a similar talk to CSSE 4011 and um, yeah, they were very drained from a semester of hard work. It's a pretty intense subject, but um, hopefully you guys have some energy. Um, so yes, welcome to the talk. As Josh said, I'm just gonna give an insight into you know, some, uh, I guess, knowledge about the industry um, for anyone Obviously, you guys might be mechatronics um, and robotics and whatnot, but nonetheless, uh, this, is a, this is a presentation about product development, about PCB design, um, and about the product development life cycle. So hopefully you find it uh, valuable. So um, Josh made it sound like I'm a big company that does lots of designs for all these places. Um, I do do lots of designs, but it is just me. I'm not a, I wouldn't call myself a company company. I mean, I am a proprietary limited company, but um, nonetheless, I'm just a solo consultant contractor, so I'll work for a company that has an idea, has a concept. They might even have engineers, but they don't know how to design a manufacturable circuit board. They don't know how to do a proof of concept. They don't know how to do the intricacies. And they'd, rather than hire three electronics engineers who'll take a year to do it, that's 300 grand of salaries. They can just hire me for, I'll quote them, 40 grand for the project take six months to do it and do it like that. It's a lot more of a nicer system for certain projects. Um, so there's, there's a bit of an overlook. I'll go into what some of these mean if you don't even know what they mean. Um, based in Melbourne, obviously went to uni here. Um, used to be a tutor uh, for 1300 TP1, TP2. Um, you can see my thesis was pretty intense. Um, I designed six different um, six different PCBs you can see here. So they were basically an educational system where down the bottom's like the main module there. It's got a connector on it, key connector, uh, and you can plug in and do all these different lessons. So like that one there, it's got, you can't really tell, but all of these little dots, these are actually lights, LEDs, uh, and it would show you, you know, high resistance means low current, which means the LEDs were very dull and they blinked very slowly whereas low resistance was high current and those LEDs were blinking really fast. So very basic series parallel circuit stuff, but all the way through to some of the ones behind it, advanced transistor stuff, you know, like 3400, um, full op amps on the circuit board, you know, inverting, non-inverting, unity gain, all of that with um, actual sockets. So they've all got sockets. Those resistors aren't soldered in, so you can put in any resistor you want. It'll measure it, it'll adjust accordingly, read it out on the thing, as well as doing that, which is pretty intense in itself, six different designs. Obviously, each of those needed three or four versions to get it right. Um, I also did a study on my thesis, for my thesis, uh, as in I took it to 1,300 uh, tutes. Um, I picked a sample size of students, did a test on them beforehand. They used them for a week, did the test on them again afterwards, saw the result change. Um, positive as you'd, you'd expect, but, you know, it, it's not a... It's not the most amazing invention in the world, so it's not like it uh, took off or anything, but that just gives you an idea of, as a fourth year student, you know, I wasn't a master student, I wasn't a dual degree, that's sort of where my um, passion and enthusiasm was, uh, especially after only doing TP1, TP2. Um, yeah, so, um, so here's my first lesson. Obviously, a lot of you, well, all of you probably, not everyone, uh, is, you, sorry, is not, a, a, isn't graduated yet, right? Undergrads, yep, maybe postgrads, but nonetheless you aren't in industry. Um, so here's a bit of my first lesson, I guess, about the industry. So I did the whole grad job thing, you know, all these large companies, Boeing, Telstra, Origin, looking for a job. Um, yeah, went through the whole process, you know, start applying in April, all these interviews and assessment centers and all of that, finally get the job in November, got the job at Telstra. So that was fantastic. You know, that's one of the best grad programs in Australia. Three-year program, you get all this accreditation, you can try different jobs out within the company. Um, but, you know, all I wanted to do was design and create 
do PCBs, solder stuff up, test stuff, write a bit of code. Um, like what you guys do, right? You just, uh, you know, as a society, is doing ro robots, building robots, testing, playing around. I realised my understanding was pretty wrong. So all I wanted to do was that, as I said, think those subjects. Telstra doesn't have R&D. Telstra don't design radio receivers. Telstra don't design the antenna towers you see. They don't, they don't design the router in your home with their logo on it. That's designed by another company, and it's got Telstra's logo on it. Yeah. That's an OEM or ODM. I'll go into that later. So I, I, I wanted to work for that company. You know, I wanted to work for the, the dudes at the bottom of the chain who were just designing the circuit boards that the big companies use. Um, so that, and my job was going to be, you know, main, maintenance of networks and systems and power. That's great if you like that. It's not really what my interest was, though. Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to give a quick breakdown of the industry. I won't spend too long on this, um, but first thing is electrical versus electronics. So, because obviously the, I know these are probably mechatronics, but nonetheless, it's, it's interesting to note um, some of the differences here. I won't... Uh, go around and probe, but you can see here just what, it's subtle in the naming, but it's very different day to day, what you'll be doing. Um, obviously I'm generalizing, but I mean, I'm not gonna account every case, I'm talking 90% of cases here, so if you work for a large electrical engineering firm, a gas company, or a mining company, this is some of the stuff you'll be doing. You'll be commissioning DIN rail systems, you'll be doing um, Excel calculations and um, doing block diagram, uh, coding for PLCs. It's it's very fun. It's very um, systematic. It's not my interest though. This is where I wanted to be. PCB designs, writing code, soldering up things, designing power supplies, all that sort of stuff. So it's a bit it's subtle. I just don't think this is explained well enough uh, throughout the degree. But that's just showing you there day to day. That's a bit of an insight into what the differences are. And same within electronics, there's obviously hardware and firmware. Um, you can try very hard to be across both. I have, and I'm focusing on hardware now. It's really hard to, you know, when you get down to the details of things like security, control systems, communications, radio receivers, all of that, it's very hard to be across the, the, the depths of that and the depths of this, um, whether that's within a job where they want you to be doing both. Usually jobs want you to focus on a task or a field or if you're self-employed, me, I probably have the skills to do both, but it means a project's gonna take two years to finish, you know what I mean? Because I can't really do both simultaneously. I can only spend so much time on one or the other. Uh, so for most of my jobs now, I'll, I'll just be doing the hardware design. Whereas when I started, uh, a lot of the ones I'll show you here, uh, well, some of them I still do, I'm doing the firmware as well. Uh, so here's just a look at some company types. So I'll just breeze through this. Um, you can see there's some companies there. You may be familiar with some of them. Uh, one of them's me, so you're definitely familiar with one of them. Uh, so, Foxconn. Anyone know what Fox? Anyone heard of Foxconn? Do you know what they do? Yes. Yep. Great. Do you know what electronics in particular, though? Just an example. A product in particular? Exactly right, exactly right. So Apple don't have a manufacturing plant. Apple don't have workers on the floor. That's not Apple. Apple, Apple outsources all of their assembly, all of their, um, even the parts within the iPhone, Apple, some of the parts, Apple don't even know the design. They don't have the intellectual property for it. They're actually Foxconn parts in the iPhone. Apple obviously do a lot of R&D. They do the design, don't get me wrong, but they don't have to go down to designing the tiny cable that connects this module to this module. There's no need for them to do that when someone like Foxconn would gladly do it for them uh, as a part of the service, I suppose. And there's ODM. So, so that's an OEM, original equipment manufacturer. It's a pretty broad term. ODM is a little bit more specific. Intelli designs a company here in Brisbane. That's where I had my first grad job when I bailed on Telstra uh, and was desperate for a grad job in uh, December. I got a referral from a, another student, which was good. Uh, so what they do is they, they're a manufacturer as well. They've got a full production line, surface mount, box assembly, everything. But they also do design, so you can go to them and they, their customers are Telstra, Boeing, CSIRO. Those are their customers. They'll go to the Intelli Design and say, we want something that does this, 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 this and this. 
and they'll do what I do, which is the design, the development, the R&D, but they'll also see it through to the manufacturing handover, test procedures, all of that. And then just some other ones like, like uh, commercial, like Cook, Cook Medical, they design and manufacture their own products, Apple. Um, they, they, even though they use Foxconn, as I said before, they're still manufacturing it in the sense that they're still responsible for the product, they're still overseeing it, all of that sort of thing. Uh, service providers, startups, I'll breeze through this, but you get, you get the gist. It's just important to know that you, know, you may go into electronics, you may go into this field, but what company you work at can have a huge effect on what sort of work you do as well. Uh, if you choose one of the ones up top or one of the ones down the bottom, you're going to be working on a nice variety of projects like me. Whereas if you go in the middle, you'll be working for LG and you'll design TV PCBs, and that's what you'll do. Like, you'll be a specialist at it, but that's all you'll do. Um, and here's some roles and job titles. So, you know, again, similar to electoral, electronics, uh, very subtle changes in the name differences, but a huge difference in what you'll be doing day to day. You know, if you, if you like the coding side, um, but you don't really like Linux and you don't like operating systems, then you'd want to become a firmware engineer. You don't want to become an embedded software engineer. Whereas if you like, if you struggle to get um, designs right and things right, you may want to be, but you have a passion for um, verification and um, manufacturing and, you know, designing test jigs or ways to test things, then, you know, production or test engineer is a really um, good path to go down as well. And, you know, these two sort of speak for themselves. Uh, yeah, so I'm breezing through these just because it, that was more for the uh, electrical specific guys. I mean, I know there's probably electrical. Is there any, is anyone in here electrical specifically? Yeah, so you just get a little bit out of it, but just didn't want to, you know, bore all the others. Um, and yeah, of course, and this applies to all engineering, uh, right? You can be the designer, the developer, the guy sitting at the desk, but I've never met a 60 year old guy who's still the designer. Uh, you know, in rare cases, yes, the real passionate ones, it's probably gonna be me. But generally, you know, they're the managers, they're the, the sales guys, uh, or they're the founders of the company, right? And those obviously have much more different day-to-day -day things. Just for a question though, does anyone know what an FAE is? Have a guess. That's a good guess, and you'd be correct. <laughs> so what a field application engineer is, it sounds fancy. Um, it's, sorry? Yeah, yeah. Exactly right. So uh, obviously you guys have done subjects like, you know, CSC 2010, um, and if you did the TP1, I don't know if it's, uh, not TP1, sorry, um, Eng 1100, is that it, first year? Yeah. And if you did the one with an Arduino, does it still use the Arduino? Like, the people who make those chips, like the AVR or the SDM, all these microcontrollers, that's a, that's a product they want you to buy. They, they want you, even though it might not seem like it, you might be late at night Googling information, trying to get it to work. The reality is in industry, once you're in industry, they want you to use that product. They want you to put it in your design so when you make 10,000 of your product, they're gonna make $20,000, $2 a chip. So because of that, companies like Atmel, SD Microelectronics, NXP, they have engineers who are literally, their job is to, you can spam them with email support and call them up and get them to send you samples, get them to help you, give you example code, all of this sort of thing. So very useful um, and they can be very helpful at times. That's what an FE is. And them and sales engineers, they're a bit synonymous sometimes, uh, but what the reason people go into these is because these are commission-based roles. So you could make like 300 grand a year if you're really good at sales in those roles, right? Because you, your money you make is based on how much you sell, how many clients you go out and meet, how many chips that they use of your, with your name on it, you sold it to them, right? You make five cents on every dollar chip. If they decide to make a million of them, right? Uh, so I'm just gonna talk about product development. I think even though you, you aren't all electrical, you're probably all hopefully interested in this. Um, so product development, when I say that, I don't mean just electronics development, I mean a whole product. I mean something that's got a screen, something that's got a case, something you hold in your hand, something that goes in your car, a product, right? Um, so obviously those fall into it. 
the electronics industry in Australia is pretty small, but the product development industry isn't small at all. And that's where you know, a lot of the jobs may be hidden under the surface. You may not see, you might go electronics engineer. I know I did when you graduate, and you might not see a lot, but that's because a lot of these companies, they, they're, they're, they're small, they hire internally, they have overseas um, offices where they just transfer people. So it's not necessarily that easy to see that the, the, how big the industry is. So these are, these are some examples of like product development life cycles. Uh, you can see it's pretty self-explanatory, right? Like this is the V model, this is my favorite. You know, you start with the concept, what it's gonna, you know, what, what should it do? What does it need to have? The detailed design, you implement it, and then you start to test it and verify it, and then you get it to mass production and it's maintenance, right? It's simple like that, but I'm gonna go into a little bit of the detail about from the electronics point of view. Um, what you wanted, what, what, what goes into it. So first is obviously the who, what, where and why. Many times I'll be designing something and, you know, when I was, in, when I was working for a company and, you know, I'd get so distracted on like getting that one sensor to, to fully work and fully calibrate it and then the boss would come over and be like, oh, you spent like 10 hours getting that temperature sensor to work? I mean, we're still on a budget, like that's fine, but the point of the product is the um, motor. Does the, temperature, does the temperature sensor really matter? You know what I mean? What's, it's always important to relate back to this. Like what's the problem you're trying to solve here? It's, every, every product has, is packed with features and capability. Uh, you know, like this laptop could be a weather station if I really wanted it to be. It's got temperature sensors, it's got a humidity sensor, it's got all that built in, but it's not its purpose, right? You wouldn't put the focus there. And this is just at the conceptual stage. So, you know, you've, you've obviously seen sort of stuff like this, you know, concepts that get drawn. This isn't the electrical engineer's job, of course. This is, a, this is what like a mechanical engineer or industrial designer might do. But then as the electrical engineer, or electronics engineer, I should say, you would do something like these, where this is a power budget. So these are all chips. This is how much power they use. This is how, how long they're on for. And then this is how much power our system's gonna use. Okay, well, if the customer wants it to last two years on battery, the battery's gonna have to be this big. Okay, well, that, that's not a feasible product, right? That's part of the feasibility study, right? And if, that, if the client wants that, you have to show them physically, it's not, not gonna happen. You can't just say to them, oh, I don't think it's possible, right? And then once you get past feasibility and con early concepts, you move to like block diagrams and things like that, as, sh as shown there. Next stage is proof of concept. So different to like an actual prototype, really shouldn't usually design, require any PCB design at all. So you can see here breadboards, drills, hot glue guns, breakout boards, Arduinos. You can pretty much get, pretty much get any product these days except something really complicated like a 5G, a 5G transceiver or something. Uh, up and running with, you know, $100 of parts from SparkFun, Adafruit and some Arduino code you found on GitHub on the internet, right? It's pretty, nowadays we're very spoilt, and so it's quite easy to do such a proof of concept stage. So this one here, right, this, this is used, um, well, the, the concept was, this goes in baby's prams, this device here. Obviously it's big and bulky here, but that's, that doesn't matter for a, a test, a trial run, a proof of concept. This is packed with sensors inside, temperature, humidity, pressure, air quality. That sits in the pram with the child. And this one here, just in, in case in, in the instance that a person doesn't have a phone, which is rare and will continue to get even rare, rarer, in, in that instance, this is gonna sit as a part of the pram and it's gonna be a basic green, red, good, bad indicator of what's inside the pram. Is it too hot? And you see this, with this, you know, 30 hours of work, some wires and a bit of code this person was able to trial this for like two months, right? I mean, that's so valuable versus going straight to a custom PCB, which is 20 grand of development. So this is always, in, and this is some of the things, you know, like that, that will help you get that. A lot of things you can leverage off and yeah, turn, turn things around quickly. But as I have here, uh, this can be a big downfall and it can, be pretty it can be pretty deceiving on how simple something can be to implement especially anything with uh, internet connectivity. So uh, here's an example. So from Jcar now, you can go to Jcar and you can buy an Arduino 
thingamajig, a sensor, and a hat that gives you 4G connectivity. So with $80 of parts, you've got this product that can be connected anywhere in the world. It can have, it could have any sensor you wanted, and you can have it up and running with 10 lines of code in Arduino with using the libraries. And you could show that to someone and be like, look, we've got this thing going. It's super easy. Look, it's like easy to develop. But then you think about, OK, what's it going to sit inside? What box is it going to sit inside? How are you going to access it? What's it actually powered off? Not you know, you're doing the demo with a power bank or something. You know, USB power bank. OK, well, OK, in practice, what's it powered off? Uh, all this data, like where's it going? Where's it hosted? What's the security level like? What's, if you're going to have one customer, how do they access all this data? Practically, if you're going to have lots of users, you know, you sell it to people and they can take it to their home and put it in their garden. It's a garden weather station. How do they log in? How do you give them a username? How do you assign that product to that user? Uh, like it, when you think about mass producing it, there's so many, so many issues where this doesn't even touch on those yet. So it's easy to show one thing working, but yeah, it means you, you're nowhere near there yet. You've just de-risked it. De -risked it. So the prototype. So this is team project, right? This is this is the, the, the meaty stuff, the fun stuff. PCB design, schematic capture, uh, mechanical design. Obviously, if you guys are mechatronics, you might have done some solid work stuff. Obviously, you can also use an off-the-shelf enclosure. This project here, this is actually, it looks like solid works, but it's it's actually Altium. It has a multi-board viewer. So I've actually popped in this enclosure. That's an off-the-shelf enclosure that you can just buy and they provide the 3D model for it. The manufacturer provides the 3D model for it, and I've put my board in, I've put the front and back panels on, and oh cool, it fits. The mounting holes line up, the connectors line up with the holes, great. Uh, but obviously, with a very custom and bespoke product, you would do that with a mechanical engineer. I'd send him the step model of the PCB, he'd put it in, he'd say we need to move that a bit. Obviously, you prototype, you can see here, it's a bit hard to tell, but um, this solder here, 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 all the solder. It's actually, um, it's, it hasn't soldered yet. That's actually paste, that's solder paste. So this is just me showing you I'm actually about to put this in the oven. It's about to be prototyped. Um, what else? And yeah, like, you know, mechanical integration, testing that they fit in the, the, mold, the you know, CNC machine prototypes, and obviously firmware and software. That's the, that's the meaty crux of it. Obviously, this is, I'm giving it one slide worth in this presentation. This is worth, you know, 10 times the, the, the uh, effort that the proof of concept takes. But nonetheless, you understand. And obviously, understanding this will have many iterations too. I've, I've gotten, I've put my heart and soul into checking every net, checking every, every connection on the schematic, every connection on the PCB, um, and got designs perfect first time. It's a very rare thing to do, very hard skill to have. And then the customer will say they want an extra sensor. There's always going to be multiple arrays. You're never going to get around it. Like here, uh, I'll show you an example later, but yeah, anyway. <laughs> so design verification. So this is one thing I, I didn't really consider too much. Um, even while I was in industry, well, I'm still in industry, but <laughs> even when I was working for someone else, I should say, but definitely didn't consider in TP, uh, and I do consider it now. So this is, this is about, you get the prototype done, and it's a part of prototyping in a way, but basically testing it. I mean, <laughs> it's one thing to just be like, yeah, okay, well, we need to power it on, we need a program, we need to make the lights blink. You know, you're getting, you're getting, don't get confused between you've got an LCD screen and you've got to, you know, put the battery indicator in the corner and you've got to put the menu here and you've got to put the, you've got to read the sensor. That's, that's, that's development, that's full-time development. This is about, does the LCD screen work? Does the LCD screen still work when it's hot, right? Um, does the LCD screen cause the power supply to be noisy? Those, it's very, it's almost, it's both before you start doing development, you want to check everything works, check things program, come to you in a second, but it's also after the development's done. So you can see here, long-term field trials, right? I'm, I guarantee you every TP project that got 100%, if it actually went out in the field, it would be, it would not work after a month or something like that, right? This is just, uh, even I know my designs, I've got 100% of my, both my TPs and I know that they would not pass any sort of certification, any sort of reliability tests. So that's another part of it. You can see here, this, this was fully, all the firmware was developed, it was quite a simple little radio thing, 
but then we got we got, got one made and then we made another 10 just to get them out there, just to throw them out in the wild, just to make sure they stayed on, they were running. This design verification, this could be 300 hours of work, but it's something that's not really thought about. You sort of think, you design it, you test it, you test it, very simple term, and then it's ready for mass production. Well, if you're confident, sure, but there's only one way to know. Um, yeah, and even subtle, subtle tricks like this one here, it's a bit hard to see. So this product here, it's got a 4G modem on it, okay? But in order to test the 4G modem, I'd have to go on the, the chip on the board, right? And I'd have to write all the software firmware to connect to the 4G modem, send the commands to, to pull data from it, all that sort of stuff, right? You understand that? But I'm not a software developer. I didn't want to do that. So what I've done here, you can't see, but this here, that's actually a USB cable that I've soldered onto the board and I've plugged it into my computer and used a software suite to test it instantly. And then look, there's the data rate. So I've tested that 4G modem instantly. Rather than wait till the firmware's developed and then is, the modem, is it the modem that's not working or is it the firmware that's not working, right? And testing things independently is important. So yeah, because I, I just remember when I started having my customers, I'd be like, all right, I'm going to need 10 hours for the schematic, 20 hours for the PCB, and then we're done. <laughs> and I had not factored this in at all. I thought in my head, the PCB, I solder it up, and then it'll work or it won't. Well, there's a lot to it. Yes? No, 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 no way. So, so it's a good question, though. Uh, so when I say you know long-term testing, doesn't mean that necessarily. It's just about say after if your product, if the firmware doesn't f glitch up, if there's no issues with it, and if there's no security flaws, and if there's nothing wrong with your power supply, if it works for um, a month in hot weather or a month in cold weather, whatever the environment it may be, or a month on a vibrating motor that it's a sensor for a motor, it's got to handle vibrations. If it works for like a month, then you've probably got confidence it's going to work for two years, right? But on top of that, if you want further, further verification, which some companies do this, is you can do uh, accelerated age testing. So you can put it in a hot environmental chamber and literally if you put it to 50 degrees, that's the same as 25 degrees for double the time. And they do that sort of test. They, 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 all, they, people like um, a big one is Agilent Keysight, who all the oscilloscopes you would have used in 1300 and other subjects, that's what they do in their R&D facility. So all their oscilloscopes, they'll put them in a big environmental chamber and test them, uh, test them to that. So exactly right, good question. It's just about, and it's a really great question actually because the reality is with testing, you can go as far or as little as you like. You could, you could design a product and not test it once, and it might work. It might, right? Knowing how much to test with, the, with your budget, with your timeline, all of that, that's the skill. Okay. Compliance. So this touches on that. Um, this touches on that as well. So anyone familiar with these marks? You should be, because they're on everything you've ever seen that has electronics inside. <laughs> uh, so what these are, these are compliance conformity marks. So this one's Australia, this one's Europe, this one's the US, this one's uh, not a specific region, it's radio equipment, and this one's China. So these represent a lot of things. These represent, to get these marks, your product needs to be safe, no matter what sort of product it is. If it's got a radio, that could be a custom radio, that could be Wi-Fi, that could be Bluetooth, that could be 4G, that could be LoRa, doesn't matter. It's got a radio in it. Even if it's a pre-certified radio, uh, it needs to not have spurious emissions, it needs to not exceed legal power levels, right? Your phone, your phone, or any, any electronic device with a radio that comes near a human, yeah, like a two-way radio, undergoes extreme testing where they have a human body-shaped solution, they put it near it and they have an RF receiver on the other side detecting how much 
the um, how much the solution heats up. That's how extreme this testing goes to to make sure that this isn't emitting too much power into my skin. It's called SAR testing, specific absorption rate testing. Okay, so that, that's how serious this gets. Um, EMC testing. So you might have heard of this. So this is people sometimes think that is EMC, like I'm EMC compliant. Well, I'm telling you, there's more than that. Uh, I didn't know this. That's why hopefully uh, you know you might find this useful. But EMC testing is specifically a bunch of tests which certify your product doesn't interfere with the environment. Different to radio, it's basically checking you, the non-radio parts of your product don't act like radios, <laughs> and it can, it can sustain interference from the environment. And that's even down to static electricity. Right? They go around with a static gun and go zap, 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 and it has to not blow up, or not fail, or not freeze. Safety testing, as I said, right? Is it, does it, if it's a mains product, does it have a fuse? If it's a battery-powered product, does it have protection to stop the battery charging when it's hot? You know, they'll literally get your product, put it in a room, raise the temperature to 100 degrees. If your device blows up, I mean, that's, it depends on the product, but if it's like a dash cam, well, your dash cam can not get to 100 degrees, but it can get close, right? Uh, you need a certifier to that to have these marks. And yes, you need to have these marks to sell legally on the market. A lot don't, but, you know, what do you know? And even down to... You've obviously heard of like IP ratings, IP67, IP68, IP66. Your iPhone advertises as IP67. Well, that, this is how you certify it. This certifies that. And industry specific, medical, space, defense, they have their own range of testing. And yes, it's a very expensive thing to go undergo, as you can tell by how, just long, how long it takes. Once you're through, once you're through compliance, Time for mass production. It's a very exciting time, but there's still a lot of work to go, right? <laughs> you need to specify how to test the units. You need to, if you want to, you can design a jig for it like this. Oftentimes, designing the jig is more complex than the product was. Uh, and, I mean, it, doesn't, it seems like that doesn't make any sense. Well, if you're making 100,000 units and the jig you designed saves you a dollar a unit, you've saved yourself $100,000. So. The jig costs ten thousand dollars to design. It is worth it. <laughs> it is ninety thousand dollars worth it. Uh, yeah, and even down to if your product, most products have a cable. Uh, sometimes it's a USB cable. That's easy. That's off the shelf. But a lot of products will have a custom cable, whether that's a custom waterproof uh, M12 connector, whether it's an FFC cable, uh, whatever it might be. That needs specifying. Uh, you might have a module that plugs into it, like a power supply. That needs specifying and checking. All of this is, this is only touching the surface of mass production, but um, nonetheless, touching on that. And then, everyone's least favourite, if you develop a product, you're selling a product, whatever it might be, even if you're like me where I, I don't own the products, I've just designed them for a company, if it's still in mass production, if it's still being sold, maintenance and support is a part of the package. Uh, there could be components on the PCB, any moment, you know, those components, one of them could go end of life and you just can't buy it anymore. That's any moment that could happen. So uh, you need to go in and you need to find a substitute. If it's a bit risky, you might have to do a little prototype run, verify the substitute works. If it doesn't work, you have to do it again. All right? that's, just, that's just one example. You could also have, again, after a year, units start to come back. Sometimes it happens. Even if you have verified it, you're confident, even if you're compliant. Compliance doesn't guarantee anything. Nothing's guaranteed in electronics, I'll tell you that now. Uh, I've never had this happen, but I'm sure my time will come. And even down to test optimization. Like I said before, uh, you know, 100,000 units, you save a dollar of time. A dollar in mass production is about a minute. So if you save a, a minute per unit, if, you, if it used to take 10 minutes to test, now it takes nine minutes, you've saved a lot of money. But oftentimes you won't do that from the get go. You would have made 1,000 already, and you, you, the CEO is going, can we bring down costs? All right, let's optimize. That's part of it. Um, and obviously, next generations of the product. So, I'm going to talk about some PCB design tips now. Juicy, juicy topic. So, uh, these are five things that you hopefully will find very useful if you're not doing them already. I'll go into each one in detail. Test points, power decoupling, trace ampicity. So, anyone know what power decoupling is? <laughs> not fair. Go. Go, go, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, it's a way of smoothing out the power of really important components, the rest of the components switching uh, from putting the electric back onto the, the power. 
very well said in the time domain. <laughs> there is a frequency domain too, but no, nope, that's very well said. Uh, yes, exactly. I'll make Laplace. Now, uh, obviously the others pretty much speak for themselves. Eh, who knows what ampacity means? Just think about it for one second. Amp capacity, ampacity. How much current a trace can put through, All right? So test points. This one's pretty basic, but um, I mean, I didn't used to put them on my board. None of my TP projects have it on it. I think my first product out of uni did, but that's because I got it ingrained in my head. So, seems simple, but I've never met a student or graduate who does this, seriously. It makes the product more manufacturable, it makes development, testing, reworks, and design verification easier. That could be these ones, which cost money and are annoying to solder in. It could be just a, the solder mask is exposed where the trace runs. Simple as that, right? There's obviously DFM and IPC standards about how big these should be, and even here, I can tell you now, this is my design, but I don't, I'm, 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 a, I'm a loose bandit, I don't care. These are too close together. As in, you can't design a test jig that is, has the, the pins that close to get those. That's not possible, right? There's all sorts of restrictions with the test points, but if you go too far, you, you know, there is a thing called over-engineering, and this is what I mean here. Requires more board space, right? This, these and the text as well, you don't need the text, but that helps. You obviously need more board space. You, board space, you literally do, especially if you follow the minimum spacing requirements. Uh, but sometimes it isn't worth it. I've designed products even now that I don't have test points on because I know with the quantities that are going to be made or the way it's tested, um, or maybe it's a module that sits on another board and that board can test it. Well, there's no point to have test points on that board. Generally not, but it does happen, right? That's what engineering is about. It's not about following this rule, it's about knowing what rules to apply when. Power decoupling. So every power pin on every single chip should be decoupled. Not just high speed chips, not just high power chips, not just the microcontroller. The temperature sensor on your board that you read once a second, that should be decoupled. Okay. Um, so there's a thing called PI analysis, that's power integrity. That's the really complex field. It's a whole field you can go into and that's about analyzing at any point on the board what is the impedance between the power supply and the chip we're talking about? That's what decoupling is. For 99% of products, it's, you can put down one of those capacitor values and you'll be fine. It's just your PI analysis comes into it when you're trying to squeeze every cent out of a product. Like 100 nano might be 20 cents. Well, maybe 20 cents is actually expensive, right? If you have 100 of them on the board and you're making a million of this product, mm, <laughs> 100 nanos add up, right? I mean, I've never had to do this. I always just do what I'm showing here. It's fine. So here's just an example. I've drawn this single-ended, but it is, it is double-ended. But obviously, the components down here, you can just move up there. This is the power supply. This is the chip. And this is what a PCB trace is. This is literally what a PCB trace is. There is parasitic resistance, parasitic inductance, parasitic capacitance from the power supply all the way to the, all the, way to the chip. Even if you have the power supply, 2V is a big power plane, a big ground plane, and the chip, it's still going to be this. There's no way around it. Uh, the resistance might drop a lot. Uh, the capacitance will increase. The inductance uh, will probably not change if it's high speed loop. High speed loop will just follow the direct path. Doesn't matter if there's a big plane like this, it's going to follow the direct path, right? So, I mean, this is what, this is time domain, Easy, easiest to understand. This is the IC, and this is, imagine this is here, power supply is here, and this is what happens when it, when it draws, especially the inductance is the cause of this, when it draws a DIDT, there is a VL equals LDIDT. Voltage drop, about 0.25 volts here, and that's a pretty, I haven't put values in here, but that's a pretty, that's a pretty standard case, and maybe that noise might look familiar to you speaks for itself, right? You literally, it's not, not, I mean, it is correct, but you know, you can think of it as like a little storage charge, a little, little battery, if you will, for that first initial gulp, that's gonna, this, all you've got now is the inductance of this and the inductance of this. That might be one nanohenry. If you just had, you know, on a 
a trace that long from this power supply to this chip it might be like, you know, 200 nano -henries. The It's orders of magnitude less inductance, way less inductance, which results in way less voltage drop. There is voltage drop still in there, you just can't see it, Nelly. Uh, and so what I was saying before as well, people will often do this just for high speed chips, because it makes sense, right? That chip's running uh, over and over and over again, we want to keep the noise off the line, right? If it's a temperature sensor we read once a second, you know, is it going to matter if that happens once a second? Well, I mean, the answer, like all engineering, is it depends. If you had that chip that's once a second near your microcontroller, okay, and this happens once a second, and if this is bad enough to happen once a second, if this here drops below the microcontroller's reset pin v, uh, v logic low limit, uh, descending threshold, which is pr probably not much lower than this, your microcontroller will reset once a second. Right? It's not very desirable because it doesn't matter how often it happens, that's just going to choose how many spikes you see. But if there's a spike at all, you should be alarmed, right? Uh, so yeah, that's just a general rule. Just put them on every single chip's power pin. For different reasons though, an op amp, an op amp doesn't switch like this. Uh, but for an op amp, it helps keeping something like this away from it, right? Um, trace ampacity. So you'd probably be surprised how much current a trace can fit. How, have a guess, how much current, I mean I've said this now, but how much current do you think a, I'm going to say a hair thin, uh, a hair strand, thin size trace can fit through it? Have a guess. How hot is the hair when it gets? <laughs> that is the correct answer. That is the correct answer. 20 degrees hotter than the ambient. <laughs> really? You're really telling me you got the formula from the IPC standard in your head? <laughs> She's got it. So a hair strand size can fit about an amp with that much temperature rise. So I'm telling you, if you, you could have done your whole TP probably. I doubt anything in TP was using more than an amp. I guarantee you, I doubt it. An amp is a lot of current. An amp is more than most, some, most of my designs use. If anything that would use it, it would be like an external thing, like a motor, not something on the board, right? Um, it can handle that much rise. Now, yes? Go ahead. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that's okay, that's okay. So, I'll go into it. So that's what you should know there. Okay, but I mean, would you, would you really let your board get 20 degrees hotter if you, ha if, you, if you didn't have to? Like, would you really do that? Would you really let your board get nice and warm? Several of these traces, they're all getting nice and warm. Like, no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, right? But it does mean that, you know, if you've got, if you've got four sensors and a microcontroller, you really don't need a big, you, a ground plane is different. A ground plane is all about signal integrity, return paths, but you don't really need a big power plane. It's a big part of YTP, well, unless things have changed, doesn't, when you're not allowed to use uh, four layer boards. You don't need to. You don't need to have signal, signal, power, ground in the middle. Um, so yeah, obviously power, power planes are quite common, uh, but that is for a different reason. Right, that is because of, as I showed here, inductance. Power plane, 3.3 volts, power plane, ground plane, two metal plates separated by a dielectric. It's a big capacitor. A nice power plane is basically a 10 nanofarad capacitor across the whole board in any location you want. That's all, that's literally what it is. So it's really great, but it doesn't justify a whole plane unless you're designing a single board computer or a radio or something like that, right? Where it can be really handy and cost effective. Uh, and here you go. So this is 10 degree rise. 0.25 can have an amp, obviously 0.2 for 25, right, it's math. Um, yeah, so it's, it's surprising, but yeah, I, I wouldn't, there's a, there is a reason people do that, it's lower inductance, you don't want it to get 20 degrees hotter. You, when I do my current calculations, I do one degree, one degree, you know, there's no need for your board to waste that energy, get hot, and think about it. Um, 
I don't have it written on here, but if, you're, if your device is in 45 degree ambient in the Northern Territory, <laughs> that 20 degree rise, that could make parts fail. Okay? And just remember, uh, I mean, I don't know thermodynamics that well, but you know, it's not like the 20 degrees like disappears when you stop drawing the current, right? It's actually heat builds and heat increases beyond the 20 degrees. Uh, thermal relief. So anyone know what thermal relief is? No, not allowed. Anyone know what thermal relief is? Anyone? Close. 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 I mean, you're sort of right. What pieces of copper? Like, what do you mean? You sort of got it. I think, you, you, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. You sort of got it. You sort of got it. So it's the opposite of what you said. It is not a heat sink. So you ever had this happen to you? Yeah, when you're soldering like some through-hole leads, like uh, especially if you've used flux already and you're still having this happen. Well, it's probably because the joint itself is to blame. That pad is probably connected to a large thermal mass. It's connected straight to the ground plane. It's connected to a big trace, right? Sometimes it's the component itself might be big, but that's rare. Um, Simple solution, it's called thermal relief. Altium will automatically do this to any pad that connects to ground, to any pad that connects to a power pore, anything like that. Both surface mount and through hole components. Because surface mount components can have it too. A surface mount component, it's got two sides, right? Two, like a resistor, right? Think of surface mount resistor, pads each side. This side is connected to the ground plane. You know, it'll have the You'll have the, the pore and veers right to the ground plane, big metal ground plane. This side is a tiny little trace that goes to the microcontroller, whatever, it could be a pull-up resistor. In a reflow oven, a reflow environment is designed so the PCB comes in the conveyor belt and the whole thing heats up to 300 degrees uniformly and then cools down. That's what it's designed to do. Practically, that doesn't happen. If you, especially, you know, you want things to go through fast. You don't want to sit there and go one degree higher, one degree higher, one degree higher, right? It's a pretty high ramp rate. Uh, in fact, chips will have a specified ramp rate. You can't do that because you can't have the chips sit there for too long. So there is a balance you need to strike. How hot and how cool. So what happens is, and with that chip, the big ground one with the connections like this, it's a larger thermal mass. It takes way longer to heat up. The thin, tiny trace, it heats up almost the same as the ambient does. This solder joint solders first, and the resistor does that. Okay? You do this, it won't happen. This, even if you make these pretty wide, like that wide, that wide, and that wide, it has a huge impact on reducing that. It's basically, a re I don't know if anyone's seen, you can model, you can model heat transfer as resistances. As in, this is like a resistor that's resisting the change here to here. Like, it's literally, you can model it as that. And you can see that that's that. Same with through-hole components. Obviously, through-hole components don't go in a reflow oven, but nonetheless, it reduces that happening. So yeah, and it's built into Altium. It's literally, like, it's a rule in Altium. It's, in fact, I think it's on by default, so, yeah. Correct, yep. It is pretty rare nowadays, but still happens. And last one, placement prioritization. I mean, it's pretty, pretty simple, but um, yeah, like instead of, I mean, I, yeah, most TP things, ex except from the connector, which, you know, it was in the spec, the connector must be here so that the two just can plug it together or it fits in the box nicely. Uh, you know, y you should think about, okay, what else am I prioritizing here? Not just throwing things down. This, and this is, I mean, every project's different, but here's some rough guidelines you can go on, right? The fixed components, as I said, mounting points, all that, you can't change that. That's, that's the system. That's the reality. But, okay, well, sensitive analog circuitry, you can put that down first. You can keep that in a, its own little zone. You can have its own dedicated return path to keep conductor coupling noise out, all of these things. Then the microcontroller and high-speed circuitry, keeping it away from that. Then the power supplies. They're very noisy, but it doesn't really matter where they go. The microcontroller might have a priority on where it needs to be. And then anyth anything else, right? I'm showing this example here because it's a similar thing. 
I don't have it on here, but you could call it sensitive analog circuitry technically. Um, first thing, antenna. The antenna. This is a Wi-Fi antenna. It needed to go there. No question about it. It needed to go there. Um, even before that, fixed components. These connectors had to be here. These could go anywhere, but these had to be here. Right? And then there's no microcontroller on this. There is high-speed circuitry. This is, this is an Ethernet port, like full internet on this port. That had to go from here to here, so I put this close, not down here, not over here because that's high-speed circuitry. Keep its path short. Power supplies. This doesn't have power supplies, but it has power paths. I wanted to keep those short and away from um, any sensitive analog circuitry over here, so this, these come in here. All three of these just go out that one port. And then anything else. So, like, the LEDs were fixed. These were to the spec. Like, there was a light pipe here, light pipe here, light pipe here. These had to go here. But the transistors driving these sprinkled all around the place. They don't, the transistor doesn't matter. It's, an LED is like a DC thing. It's on or it's off. It doesn't matter where the trace goes. If an LED picks up noise, it's not going to actually bright and shine the noise unless you've done something really, really bad. Okay? So, yeah, hopefully those tips sort of... Uh, Give a bit of insight. I was going to show some designs now as well. Yes, I do get pulled up at the airport a lot. <laughs> oh, so any any questions so far? Yeah. Um, with the uh, compliance testing, yeah, do man. you have to do that, or do you say to your client, "Hey, this hasn't even verified tested. You need compliance to be standard." Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a good question. Um, it's 100% the client's responsibility. So, I mean, I, I offer it as a service. I mean, you can see here, there's me getting some compliance testing done, right? I, I offer it as a service, I help them through that uh, because much like manufacturing, which I have a lot of knowledge about because of Intelli Design, uh, I have a lot of knowledge about compliance testing too. Compliance testing, you need to identify the standards. You need to write a test procedure to actually test the product. You know, you don't just throw it in the room. You have to, you know, if it, if it plugs into a laptop, you need to have software running on the laptop. You need to make sure they're connected and working. If it has a radio, you need to have a radio receiver in the room with it. The writing a test spec for that's its whole thing. Um, and then if there's issues, that's a whole thing. You know, looking at your design, what have I done wrong? Do I need to add a filter? Do I need to do this? Because there's a lot involved, I offer that as a service as well. But a lot of people will be, you know, they'll be a CAD engineer or something, they'll do the design, but they don't really have the skill or interest to go into compliance. So nonetheless, though, I mean, I help them with it, but they're paying for it. You know, it's, it's their responsibility. I don't sort of offer it, and I don't ever guarantee compliance within the design fee. You know, there's no, no way you can guarantee compliance. So try and zoom in a bit. Okay, so this one, this one's actually on Instagram, uh, the company. So this, uh, this is called Force Hooks Force Test Device. So this is a Wi-Fi based system. So this is a Wi-Fi module, which is also a microcontroller. This is a buzzer. That's a cable for an LCD screen. Battery charger, battery management system. Rechargeable battery here. You can see the USB-C connector here for charging it. Uh, that's a button interface. Lots of goodies, but here's the, the, the real stuff. This is a uh, really, really, really expensive and really powerful analog to digital converter. So not your, not your Arduino 10-bit, uh, 1 to 10, 1 to 1,023 uh, counts of resolution. This is a 24-bit. So this is, this is on a three volt system, this can measure, uh, I think, under a microvolt, right? Very, very sensitive. And what plugs into it is a load cell. Anyone know what a load cell is? Yep? Basically, a setup of resistors that lets you measure force on a. Perfect. 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 Like a strain gauge, but a full system strain gauge already all collated together. And so this. This um, load cell is all packed into this. So the, the circuit board, the load cell, the display, it's all this little cube thing. And you go to the gym and you hook it up to the bar and you can literally measure newtons in millisecond resolution on what you're lifting that bar at. Um, all printed out on the 
I can't show you here, but the, it has an LCD screen that's the same size of it. Prints the graph of it, has Wi-Fi, you can send it to your cloud, look at your dashboard, look at your profile, all of that sort of thing. So I've developed the hardware for this. I did the initial firmware as well, so I did, you know, testing to make sure this worked, testing to make sure the battery system worked, you know, the, the Wi-Fi worked, all of that. Sorry? As in, well, so it just plugs in here. So it's an external module, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry? Yeah, that connector there. I think the light's not that good, but you can see. Uh, yeah, so this is one of my first ones when I went full-time about 15 months ago. And the guy's just in Perth. He's a young guy like me. Uh, I, think he's, yeah, I think he's 24, same age as me. Um, and he's, yeah, he's... He's selling it to like, you know, he hasn't, it's in mass production now, but you know, his customers are AIS, an NBA team, all these sort of things. He's, he's had a lot of luck um, and I'm yeah, pretty happy for him, but yeah, so that, that's, that's one there. Uh, <laughs> so this was my first ever project um, as my own client. So. When I did this, I was working on. The, I was doing this on the side. I, I got permission from my work to do this. Um, obviously, sometimes it can be a conflict of interest. You know, you, you know, you could be secretly working on it while you're at work, or you could be stealing their designs and using it. Um, obviously, talked it through a bit, and I was able to allowed to do this. So I was very fortunate. Um, so this is a smart target system. So this this will receive a, a laser from another product that I've designed, which is the the, the gun, I guess. The trainer is the official term. Uh, just a laser-based system. The laser's modulated, so that ambient light won't make it just go off. Uh, can be used outdoors. Has a diffuser on the front, so the laser will spread. So these are actually, you know, there was a lot of R&D actually into working out how tightly we space these. Is that too far? Is that too close? The closer you have them, the more you're going to need, the more it's going to cost, right? Uh, so yeah, this is, there's been 500 of these made so far. And yeah, it's a, it was a Bluetooth system. It's now a Wi-Fi system. Uh, you can see on the back, it's actually the same chip as the last design. That's the company there, ProShooter. And yeah, battery powered as well. And USB recharge, same sort of, uh, very, very similar, but just obviously different sensing technique, RGB LED. And so this is, yeah, this is a very, um, very close to my heart. You know, it's one of my first ever projects. And yeah, it turned out to be a, a success. So he, the, the, the customer had a system already, but it was just the single LED, right? So you just you hit the target or not. This has a full software suite. You can see, you can have 10 targets, it'll have them all, it'll have where you've hit. It has little game modes where the LED will change to red, it's a terrorist, you've got to shoot it. It'll go green, it's a hostage, don't shoot it. It's full suite now, because it's got that Wi-Fi connectivity, right? Um, yeah. What's that one? This one's pretty cool. So this one, still in development. So I won't say too much about it, but it is, zoom in a bit. I won't show the client name, but I will say, so this is used in, um, this goes in beehives. So this sits in beehives. It has temperature, humidity, pressure, gas level, air quality, sound, all of that built in, all on these little islands here, packed with sensors, sits in the beehive, has external sensors as well. And this here, this is a radio and a microcontroller built into one, one little module. That's the radio's antenna. And yeah, it, it basically has five kilometer plus range. You can put in your, your frame, you can have your beehive kilometers from your house, and you can just get the data back through a gateway. Uh, it's, the goal isn't actually like hobbyists, it's actually commercial bee farms, so it's sort of trying to be on the thousands of scale. Very serious product, a lot of money has gone into this. I mean, as you can tell, it's, it's probably one of the most, I wouldn't say complex, but the most well-crafted, you know, down to all the test point coverage, down to even the, the programmer isn't a connector, it's just pads to program it, you know, uh, as well as the onboard antenna. But very cool, you know, save the bees and stuff. Um, yeah, so that's that one. And then, Show one more. Uh, so this one here, the client actually went bust, unfortunately. But uh, I look like a port. I look like a bad designer because that's the same chip again. <laughs> I 
I'm just going <laughs> to... Yeah, yeah, efficient. Efficient. Um, <laughs> Platforms, they're the platforms, basically, right? Yeah, I'll just show these. I do use other, I do use other radios. I swear. <laughs> there's MBIT, there's 4G, and you obviously saw the uh, the B one was LoRa, right? Long range radio. Anyway, Wi-Fi system, of course. This one you can see here, though. It's obviously got the the classic, you know, power board and analog board, well, analog and digital mixed signal. So this one goes in, well, it was going to go in <laughs> um, factories, and it was going to monitor the quality of conveyor systems. Uh, the bottom has some complex stuff on it. Those two gold connectors, one outputs a laser, laser signal that's modulated, one inputs the laser signal that's modulated, and using that laser signal, they can basically measure does the conveyor belt need maintenance? What's wrong with the conveyor belt? Where does it have the issue? All of these things that I don't know about, I don't need to know about it, I'm the hardware designer. Um, so that's all that fancy stuff. Analog front end, lots of amazing things happening. And then the other side, as you sort of saw, it's basically just the microcontroller, a bit of a beastie one. A bunch of external interfaces to motors, uh, and then the Wi-Fi interface as well. And then obviously the power board, and all the power board does, it takes, get that out of the road, it takes, you can see, 10 to 25 volts in, and then this just outputs 5, 3.3, uh, 12 volts, uh, minus 5, minus 3.3, very TP-ish uh, in its modular design. I don't do this a lot because it's often, you know, you, you've got to remember, you've got effectively got two products here. This isn't one product, it's effectively Two products that need manufacturing, two products that need testing, two products that need verification. Um, but hey, it, it does de-risk a project a lot. So, yes, that's, uh, that's all I'll do for show and tell. Obviously, I've got lots more in the box, but confidential, you know. Cool, so that's it. I'm on the hour mark, I think exactly, if you count the start, late start. So I'm happy with that. So thanks everyone for watching. Any last questions? Happy to take any questions. Yes. Yes. Oh, um, definitely Art of Electronics. It's probably the only one I can recommend. Really, there's a lot of mixed PCB design. Funnily enough, can be ambiguous and it can be opinionated in approaches. The reality is. Um, you can only learn so much from text. The reality is the quality of product you see here, it's from many, many designs, many, many iterations of that product, but also prior, previous products. I've done, I've done over 100 designs. When I say 100 designs, I don't mean 100 little hobby projects. I mean 100 professional grade, put my heart and soul into it designs, and that's, that's to get to the point where I am now. There's no, yeah, the, the experience is un invaluable, but Art of Electronics helps a lot too. That's what I'll say. Yes. Do you subcontract at all? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, no, look, I I tried subcontracting. Um, I tried, oh, you know, maybe I want to expand the business. To be honest, it's really hard. It's really hard when you, and you know, if you if you ever want to run your own company one day, you know, keep this in mind. It's really hard when you, you know, you you negotiate with a client. You say, okay. This is going to take 30 hours. And they say, all right, how much is that? You say, okay, that's going to be whatever. I'll make up a number, 1,000 bucks, right? It's definitely not. <laughs> 30 hours for 1,000 bucks, well. Um, it's not that. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, so they'll say, okay, right, that's fine. 1,000 bucks, I can agree with that. You go to your, and I've done this. I have done a subcontractor once before, and I will never again. Um, and you say, all right, you've got 30 hours. Yep, sounds good. Subcontractor, you know, a close friend of mine, you know, he, oh, sorry, look, I've, I'm, at, I'm at 30 hours, it's going to take more time. You know, I, it's just going to take more time, that's the reality of it. So, what do I do? Do I go ask the client for more money? Do I ask him to work for free? Do I pay him and just take the loss? You know, I just won't make as much of a profit. Well, I mean, that's literally him taking money out of my pocket. The subcontractor is taking money out of my pocket. And that's the same with employees. I mean, that's the reality of it. it, it 
it's a bit confronting, but you know, your boss at your job, if you're not being productive, you are literally taking money from the company you're working at, right? Managing people is a whole job in itself. It's a whole skill set in itself. It's a whole career path in itself, and it's not something I'm interested in now. Probably won't be ever. Um, the only time I can see myself hiring someone, yeah, which I can, I can, it's in the scenario where I wouldn't be a consultant anymore doing what I do. It would be where I had my own products. When I've got my own products, someone could, you know, you could be sitting there working on that product for hours and hours and hours. Doesn't matter. As long as it sells well, I'll make my money back. Consulting, it's by the hour on the hour. Even if you, even if I had a subcontractor who um, I'd promised time to, or I had an employee who, that's 40 hours a week. If I'm not giving him 40 hours every week of work, 40 hours is a lot of work. It's a lot of work to, to win from a client, right? A project is only gonna be 100 hours, 200 hours maybe, right? 40 hours is, goes like that, and to make sure they're billable 100% of the time, it's almost like a law firm. A very, got to, I've got to be out winning work, I've got to bring new clients in, got to make sure my employees are doing work, then I'm not doing the designs anymore, you know. So, yeah, we're in a bit of a rant, but the answer is no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, any more questions? Yeah. Um, what fields in electronics uh, can you become a consultant for? Like... Any, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely any. Um, like me, for example, I'm... I don't like the term, but I'm I'm a bit of a generalist. You know, I I've never found I've never had a project where they've said we have this special thing, and I've said no, no I know I don't know much about that because the reality is even if you know lots about something, you're going to have to allocate time to research it, to do the proof of concept thing, to de-risk the project, right? But the reality is, me if I had a project where as an example, right, the B1, it's got the onboard antenna. These antennas are notoriously bad out of the box because they're designed for very large PCBs. But you can tune them to be good with a circuit board even this size. Tuning an antenna takes about three years of practice and a $25,000 bit of equipment. And it takes about five minutes to do it, but you need that up front to be able to do it. Uh, luckily, I have that bit of equipment now. <laughs> but at the time, for me to, for me, and then to promise my client down the chain to hire you as an RF consultant, and you've, that might be the only bit of equipment you've got, you might charge me $300 an hour, but I only need you for two hours. That's absolutely easy for me to do, and you would have other, you'd have heaps of clients, but that could be your specialty. Power electronics, all those designs I showed you, they've all got DC-DC converters, I'm pretty good at designing power stuff, but I've never designed something that plugs into the power point. Something with high voltage, right? I always have a little USB adapter in the way because that saves you developing that. It also means less safety certification, all those other reasons. But if I had a product that needed that, I would either hire a consultant to train me, I would hire a consultant to do the design for me, design a module, all that sort of thing. So there's, there's a whole world in itself of people hiring people and outsourcing to outsourcing to outsourcing. So there's potential for anything. Um, yeah. Obviously, you'd be general like me, uh, a lot more projects that you could do but a lot more competitors as well uh, that you're dealing with and a lot more experience than you. Like, I, I, I went full time with only two years of experience, but that whole time I was working on the side, I would have been doing 80 hour weeks. Um, and that's that extra 40 hours of me working for myself, paying, I, I, I would have paid probably 20 grand in, out of my own pocket while at jobs to do training courses on EMC, on manufacturing, on, RF design, all of that stuff, you know, whether it's from consultants or from Udemy, from whatever it is, YouTube even, um, many, many hours sunk into that. You can't shortcut the experience, but you, you can try really hard to shortcut a lot of other things as well. Yep. Yeah, I was going to ask you, um, and it was like, those courses actually were good and they helped you. Yeah, 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 but again, that sort of got me to say like the five year experience mark with the knowledge, I guess, but things like you know, just, just, just little stuff like, uh, here we go, just little stuff like this one here, okay, this side, all service mount, this side, these are all through hole components. By doing that, I reduced the cost of this product by 30%. Even this LED here, 
That's a service mount LED, but it's on the other side, right? I know that. I, know, I knew to do that because I knew from other products that have been through manufacturing what that cost implication had had, and I knew it was worth me spending extra time to make sure all those products were like, those like that. So now it only has to go through the service mount process once, and it has to go through the through-hole process once. If you've got components on both sides, if it's one component on the other side, like this one here, again, there's no rules to follow. It's knowing when to apply rules. This one here, unfortunately, it had to have a component on the bottom. It was, it's, a, it's the only microphone with this spec we needed, and it's a bottom port mic. The microphone has to be this side. Right? Couldn't do it there. Right? But I knew I could do it on the other product. Right? And even here, I knew that I didn't want to split the parts 50-50. If you can at least minimize the parts on this side, it's still going to minimize cost. So something like that is, you know, that's, that's something from experience. That's from having products that have gone through manufacturing before. Yeah, uh, no, so I've never, I didn't do anything before uni. TP would have been my first design. Um, but I, I, I'm counting, okay, TP's one, TP two's another. Thesis is like five designs in that. And then Elect 4403, anyone done it? Anyone doing it? Is that like the masters? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, that's the ECG one, you know, like the heartbeat. It's a breadboard project. I did a PCB for it just because I could. <laughs> so, you know, that I count, we'll count those eight or whatever, but then, yeah, the rest would have been five at my first job, which is rare. Usually you might get to do two a year, three a year if you're at a big company, um, and then maybe six or seven at my second job, and then, yeah, the rest, the rest since the last year. It's only been 15 months, but it's been about two or three designs a month. It's been crazy. Because of COVID, I was in Melbourne. I could do 60, 70 hour weeks and it didn't really affect my social life because Melbourne was pretty quiet and pretty locked down most of last year. Well, no, because I... So when you're at a company, you, 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 are, you are the bottom of the chain. You have the, the client manager, the project manager, and you will, you, will get, you will get this many hours to do this project. You need to test it thoroughly. You need to do this and do that. Me, I can go out there and... There's no, there's no meetings, there's no someone reviewing my work, it takes a week, there's none of this, it's, it's a client tells me what they want, I go, all right, I dive into Altium, I design it, I send it out, done, you know what I mean? Um, obviously now, as I get more experienced, I am putting more overheads in place, like I check it myself. If it's a really complex design, I'll hire another consultant to check it for me, right? But at the start, it was definitely running and gunning, designing, 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 so... Yes. Any other questions? Good, because I'm pretty exhausted. <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys.